Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by Harry Jones, who's come across to us from NASA Ames. Harry's no stranger to uh, SETI, though. He worked on the SETI project while it was funded by uh, the federal government, uh, so he knows a lot of people uh, here from his time uh, working with them. He uh, did a master's at Santa Clara University and a uh, PhD in engineering uh, with uh, at uh, Penn, at Penn uh, State University. No, the University of Pennsylvania. University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, being Australian, I have no dog in that fight, so I'll, I'll just... <laughs> University of Pennsylvania. And uh, he worked on the Apollo program, um, uh, working on tracking the uh, returning capsules uh, and uh, as they uh, descended into the ocean. Uh, and uh, he has recently been working on Constellation um, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, a topic that's a little further off uh, into the future, um, but hopefully uh, something uh, which will be vital uh, to humanity at some stage. So if you'll all join me in uh, welcoming Harry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my current job is in uh, life support and I wanted to investigate uh, Starship life support in order to uh, provide an extreme case for the uh, design of life support systems. I do have uh, fond memories of the uh, SETI project. Uh, it was on my trips to JPL for uh, the SETI project funded by the government that I got to know uh, my wife, who is in the audience uh, today. So uh, it was uh, probably my best project. Uh, okay, proceeding onward. This is an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, a multi-generation interstellar starship is investigated as a test case for life support. This is uh, extreme long duration life support. Uh, on this uh, starship, the travel speed must, must be uh, much less than the speed of light uh, due to the constraints of physics. That means the travel time will be decades or centuries, uh, uh, hundreds of years, and that means multiple generations of humans must make the voyage. In this uh, talk, I restrict myself to uh, things that are possible in current physics and possible in current technology. Uh, uh, I developed my own mission plan because I couldn't find anything that, that met those criteria in a, in a quick search. The goal of, of the interstellar voyage is to establish a human colony with minimum cost. Cost is definitely an object that can't uh, uh, cost impossible amounts of money. Uh, the cost of the mission will be proportional to the mass launched. Uh, the more mass that has to be launched into low Earth orbit and uh, pushed onto a distant star, the more it's going to cost. Uh, this, this means the crew size must be small to save cost and the cost can also be reduced if the, true, if the crew travels slowly and lands with a minimum amount of equipment. Uh, my study concludes that the life support system design for a starship will be very similar to the life support system for the space station that's up there right now operating. Uh, this is an unusual uh, conclusion. Somebody's adjusting my mic here. Uh, oxygen and water will be recycled in the uh, life support system, and food will be supplied, but it'll probably, probably be dehydrated to save mass. Uh, the food that's used now is hydrated. <coughs> um, Bioregenerative life support, growing the crops hydroponically to provide food, is what's usually considered to be necessary for uh, long missions, but it was not found to be competitive in the study. Uh, this is an outline of what the Starship uh, Life Support talk will uh, mention. I'm going to talk about new planets, uh, how far away they are, the need for nuclear propulsion, uh, and then describe the mission. The more crew members that we send, the more likely the mission is to succeed, but the higher the cost. 
we also need high reliability life support and I am interested in achieving high reliability life support. Uh, the life support will either be recycled air and water with supplied food as in space station now or growing food hydroponically. Growing food hydroponically also recycles uh, the oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen and recycles water by transpiration. So it meets, growing food hydroponically will meet all the uh, needs for life support. Uh, to have high reliability, we need more mass and more cost. Uh, which, which will have the minimum mass? Well, it's the space station approach. Uh, a couple of chairs up here. Um, and then I'm going to go into designing a multi-generational uh, spacecraft. Uh, the paper that this talk is based on has detailed design based on uh, designs for uh, planetary bases. As I'm sure everyone knows here, uh, uh, there are many extrastellar planets that have recently been observed, about 500. None of these are Earth-like, but we would expect the uh, Kepler project to find some uh, soon. Most of the current planets are gas giants close to the stars due to the, due to the uh, screening effect of the detection methodology. But the Kepler, as I was saying, uh, might find Earth-like planets relatively soon. Uh, given the distribution of uh, stars and planets, the earliest uh, human interstellar colonization voyages will probably travel between 4.3 and 16 light years. Uh, 4.3 light years being the distance to Alpha Centauri, uh, which is a multiple system, uh, but the stars are widely separated. It's, it's generally, it's always been uh, believed that stars not in multiple systems would have planets due to the conservation of angular momentum in the dust cloud. Uh, within, uh, fifth, within 16 light years, there are 55 stars, including uh, 31 single stars. So I'm saying, uh, without actually knowing what our target is, it could be approximately 10 light years away. Uh, this means we need travel speeds of a, between 1% and 10% of the speed of light C. Um, obviously, to go 10 light years at 10% the speed of light takes 100 years, at 1% it takes 1,000 years. So we need a multi-generation uh, uh, voyage to get uh, to place a, a human colony on a nearby star. <coughs> this, uh, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I will talk about the famous rocket equation. Uh, the rocket equation uh, det determines the final velocity of the uh, spacecraft as equal to the exhaust velocity of the propellant. Uh, times the natural log of the total mass divided by the vehicle mass. Uh, the total mass includes the mass of the vehicle plus uh, a large amount of propellant that's used to push the, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, move the rocket forward. This is both, uh, uh, for chemical rockets, the, the uh, oxygen, hydrogen, or whatever react and also provide mass to push backwards. So here we have E is the rocket exhaust speed, MT is the total mass of the vehicle, plus fuel, MV is the mass of the vehicle itself. This graph shows uh, the uh, final spacecraft velocity V divided by the exhaust velocity over here uh, versus the total mass divided by the uh, vehicle mass. Uh, in this little box, we have sort of a feasible region where the uh, spacecraft velocity is two or three times the exhaust velocity of the uh, propellant, uh, but the mass required is between eight and 20 times the original mass. So we need large amounts of mass to push the rocket uh, forward. Um, so to get two or three times the exhaust velocity, we have eight to 20 times the uh, mass. And uh, the most important and interesting extraneous fact I'm bringing in here is uh, Obviously, we need uh, an exhaust velocity and a spacecraft velocity that is uh, greater than 1% of the velocity of uh, light if we're going to arrive in uh, less than a millennium. Chemical rockets, the rockets we use now, simply uh, cannot do this. And uh, the rocket, for those of us who, who don't work with a rocket equation like me, it's quite feasible if you consider the Apollo launch and how large the Saturn rocket was and how small the payload was at, on top. Um, okay, nuclear propulsion could work. Uh, perhaps uh, this, is, this is sort of a back to the future moment here. 
nuclear rocket propulsion is achievable with current or near technology. Uh, the project Orion, uh, Freeman Dyson was involved in that and wrote, uh, wrote up uh, the results. It was conducted in the early 60s to develop nuclear pulse propulsion. Well, what is nuclear pulse propulsion? This is a, an idea of exploding small nuclear bombs behind a rocket to accelerate it by pushing into a pusher plate and moving the rocket forward. Um, it was considered uh, feasible to explode in the order of a thousand small tac tactical sized nuclear bombs behind a rocket to launch it uh, from Earth and into uh, outer space. Um, amazingly enough, this project was not continued. Uh, a fatal <laughs> A fatal blow to it was the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited uh, nuclear explosion in the atmosphere, which uh, uh, certainly would have frowned on doing thousands of them. Okay, but nonetheless, it is uh, considered to be feasible technology. Uh, nuclear pulse propulsion using fission could achieve 3% to 5% the speed of light. Uh, if uh, thermonuclear fusion was achieved, we could get up to 10% of the speed of light. Um, many similar systems have been investigated since then. Robert Zubrin proposed a nuclear salt water rocket. It had the advantage uh, that it could use uh, smaller uh, vehicles and it generates continuous, not pulse thrust. Uh, and it could, it could reach three or four percent of the speed of light. So, <coughs> uh, this is possible technology. It's not going to be developed on Earth. The future. Uh, in a future time, it could be developed uh, uh, it, perhaps in the outer solar system and used for interstellar travel. It's technically feasible, not uh, politically feasible at the current time. Uh, so we can get 3% to 10% of the speed of light and take to go our 10 light years we think we have to go. It's 100 years or 333 years. And that's uh, many generations, 4 to 13 generations of, of human life. So how, this is a sort of sketch of the mission plan. I'm going to go into more detail. Suppose first that the uh, t target planet is 10 light years distance. Uh, we have a exhaust speed of 1% of the speed of light, a final velocity of 2% of uh, the speed of light. Uh, our total mass is 7.4 times the vehicle mass itself. And uh, we travel, uh, a travel time is 500 years uh, or 20 generations. Uh, but here's a problem. We get there and we're going pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew someone would, would notice that. So I have, I have the next point here, which is we're not going to stop. If nuclear propulsion is used to decelerate the starship, then we need another 7.4 times the mass. And oh, by the way, to get that 7.4 times the mass out to the new distant star, we need 7.4 times that mass, or 55 times the total original mass of the little vehicle. So we're not going to stop. Uh, this is too much mass. Uh, it's very costly. To minimize the mass, I'm assuming that most of the spacecraft will travel onward. It's, it's used to support uh, the crew for hundreds of years, but uh, it's not it's not material that's needed on the uh, new planet. Uh, I'm assuming that only small descent vehicles detach from the interstellar spacecraft and land on the new planet. These will be vehicles something like Apollo capsules. I was going to say Apollo and Orion capsules as envisioned by the new Constellation program, but I took that out. Um, we have to be current in our charts. Uh, so the abandoned interstellar spacecraft continues past the new planet. Uh, there are going to be more, I have much more details about this, but that's roughly how it's going to work. Uh, do I go backwards? Okay, the number of crew members. Uh, so how many people do we need to send to colonize a new planet? The more we have, uh, the more the probability of colonizing success increases. But uh, I believe and will argue that a very small crew could succeed. Um, Increasing the crew size gives diminishing returns. That is, the more people we send, the less there is for them to do. Uh, I'm not going to quite get down to Adam and Eve, but uh, we'll, next chart, that's the next chart. Uh, I argue that a smaller crew will have a higher expected number of colonies per crew member. That is, that at a certain point, 
Uh, it's better to send two expeditions to two planets rather than double up your current uh, <coughs> expedition. Well, the number of crew members is a major uh, mission parameter, as we say in NASA. It determines the total mission mass. Uh, but the design trade-offs can be made independently of the crew size, just using the mass per crew member. And that's what's typically done in, in life support or in, in uh, spaceship sizing. So I'm going to be working largely with the uh, mass per crew member. So I'm only actually going to use the expected number of crew members at the end to figure the, the total size. Um, but it is interesting, so I'm going to go into some detail. Uh, what is the best number of crew members? Well, uh, I start with an assumption that I pulled out of the air after searching in the air for a long time. <laughs> uh, I mean, how many people does it take to start a new colony on a new planet? Uh, I say <laughs> 30 people. <laughs> Five families of six members and a total of 30 crew. Now, they'll have some probability of succeeding. I'm going to say, uh, uh, given certain ideal conditions, which I'll discuss in my very last chart, uh, that they will have a 75% probability of success. Well, so we send 30 people. We have reason to hope or believe that they have a 75% um, chance of success. Well, then if we send 60, they'll have nearly 100% probability of success. And I think that's fairly obvious if you think about it. We have two crews of 30. If we send them to two different places, each one has a 75% has a chance of succeeding. That's a 25% chance of failing. Uh, the, the chance that both working independently fail would only be 1 16th, 6%. So there's about a 94% chance of success if we send two crews instead of just one, if one has a 75% chance of succeeding. But in fact, if you combine a crew, uh, you have more, more resilience and more specialties and more, you know, it's just better in a lot of ways. So probably the, it would, we would have 100% chance uh, with a crew of 60. Again, still assuming that a crew of 30 gets you 75% chance of succeeding. So, what does a colony cost? A colony costs one sixtieth person. That's the price we're paying. Now, but instead, we could send these two crews to two different planets. Each one has a 75% probability of success. A, the expected number of, of planets that we're going to uh, succeed in colonizing is one and a half. Well, one and a half is a lot better than one. Uh, and so we get one uh, colony uh, for 40 crew, one fortieth per crew. So, so if the interstellar colonization program is, is a large NASA program, uh, we'll probably do more than one colonization. But the question is, what is the optimum amount then to spend on each attempt? And I'm saying a relatively small crew which, with a relatively reasonable chance of success. Uh, Although 30 is, uh, is a guess number, it seems clear that if, if a crew is large enough to give a 75% chance of success, it's not cost efficient to double the crew. It's more cost efficient to send two, two missions. A crew of 30 seems reasonable to me, maybe 15, maybe 30, but three looks a little few, 300 looks a little many. At this point, does anyone want to ask a question or make an objection? Yes. <laughs> uh, the lady behind the, yeah. No. I have not, and I will not. I will not discuss reproductive technology or options. <laughs> Any other questions? But uh, Jones did that. In fact, looking, um, there's a study on, on this very question, and a crew of 16 with no matched bad alleles is all you need to well, include, to uh, have bio, and, a, and a pairing rule that says no mating closer than first cousin. Thank you, Joe. That's what you need. Uh, well, that's great, and that's an answer. Uh, and that's, that would indicate that this crew is, is large enough. But I was picking the size not only for reproductive reasons, but for uh, sort of the ability to succeed by having enough specialties. Uh, yes, sir, back there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that that part in the future, that could be what email is for anyway, too. Email is for. Uh, I'll get into email. Okay. Well, as uh, this is an interesting topic. In fact, if I don't, yes. <laughs> Are you assuming uh, constant velocity, uh, constant exhaust velocity during the journey? Uh, you can do a lot better 
uh, if you have a low exhaust velocity in the beginning and a higher exhaust velocity after you've used up some of your fuel? Uh, I, I, didn't, I did not look at that carefully. I assumed something like the minimum energy home in orbit kind of thing where you uh, give a big uh, push at front and then, and then coast. Uh, don't forget it's 500 years, so what's long and short, uh, uh, what's, what's short is, is really long. Uh, is, have you given any consideration to like, uh, like social dynamics? When you're talking about an optimum crew size, do you start to ask yourself at what point does the crew, I, I, know, I know that like, you know, something like mutiny well, sounds silly, but at what point is a larger group not favorable to a smaller group? When you're talking about... I'd say, I'd say about this room size is a little too big. Uh, but no, I haven't discussed, discussed the thought about that topic. This is, this is a number of, uh, kind of pulled out of the air. Um, yes. The, uh, as for the number needed for genetic diversity in animals, uh, in cheetahs specifically, they were, uh, people had looked at that and it's about 50, 50. Mi a minimum of 50. And there's more recent work that says for a, uh, the minimum number for a species to enable evolution to take place is 5,000. Well, that's, that's very interesting, very true, and not pertinent to this discussion. Uh, uh, the point is that I'm actually not discussing reproductive technology options, uh, and the crew size was, not, was, the size was not based on that. Okay, well, I can't... Okay, one more. <laughs> How, how long are you talking about uh, people colonizing this place? Is this a, like a forever thing? Oh, yeah. It's a one-way. <laughs> First of all, most, most people are not going to make the, the trip. It's 20 uh, generations or more. Okay, I have not, not been able to get past these charts without a riot, so I thought I'd, <laughs> thought I'd just have it now, and now I'm going to push on. Uh, now, this, this is a boring topic. This is my personal research here. Just all go to sleep. <laughs> life support system reliability. Uh, well, it has, this life support has to work for generations, not just for uh, uh, a two-week uh, shuttle mission. Uh, how do we get reliability? Well, redundancy. Suppose uh, we have a system that has a 1%, a 10 to the minus 2 chance of failing during the whole mission. Well, if we send two, the chance that both fail is 1% is, uh, squared or 1 in 10,000, so it's much better. If we, ha if we use dual redundancy, it's how it works is fairly simple. We double the mass, which is the penalty, but we square the failure uh, probability, which is, which is good. Uh, but if you provide selected spare parts, it's much more mass efficient than providing whole systems. In fact, if you take a system, break it apart, look at all the mass and all the reliabilities of all the components, and provide spares where you're needed to increase the overall reliability while keeping the mass down. It turns out, it turns out pragmatically that very high reliability can be achieved with the spares mass equal to the original mass. So we can double the mass and get essentially a very low uh, failure probability. Now this is not an as-built failure probability, it requires maintenance. Uh, that is, things fail and things are, are repaired. Uh, one of the nice things about building life support systems as opposed to rockets, missiles, and satellites is that there are always people there and they need the system and they're going to fix it if it breaks. So, you know, we rely on that. <laughs> so, to achieve, high to achieve high reliability, we use double the original system mass and replace the whole system every 100 years. I call that a 200 system because I do other kinds. I'm sure there are no questions on that. Okay. Uh, Starship life support ESM, ESM, another uh, life support uh, technical thing. ESM is equivalent system mass. It's an attempt to convert all the costs of providing a life support system into a kilogram cost that's called ESM. The ESM includes the mass of the system itself, what it weighs, the mass of the logistics supplies, everything you have to send to keep it going. The mass need to provide the volume. You need to put the equipment in a, in a pressurized box and that box is, is a metal container. You need power, power supply costs, I'm assuming nuclear. Uh, obviously, there's no solar power between the stars. And cooling, we need, we need to dump the heat into space. That's very easy in inter interstellar space. So this is the equivalent system mass. It's the mass, uh, volume, power. Cool the mass equivalent of volume, for instance, is how many kilograms it takes to provide a cubic meter, 
mass equivalent of power, ditto. It's the, some shielding plus replacing the nuclear as it's uh, used up, as it, it decays, uh, and the logistics. Okay. Uh, the logistics mass includes the consumables, the food, filters, fixing, packaging, spares, all that. So ESM is how we measure cost. And it turns out a major cost for real, real missions is, number one, launching the, the vehicle, and number two, most systems uh, cost is crudely estimated uh, proportionally to its mass. Uh, ha! Well, here's uh, life support as currently implemented in the uh, space station. This is the water uh, regenerating system. It has uh, multi filtration. It has a uh, vapor compression distillation system that essentially boils off urine. Uh, the, the clean product is mixed with other uh, wastewater condensate from the atmosphere, uh, uh, used wash water, um, and all put through a multi filtration system in this box. Over here we have oxygen generation. Oxygen is generated from water. It uses uh, electrolysis. Uh, the Russians have been flying these systems. Uh, by the way, the failures of, the, of uh, the urine processing system usually are the only thing that gets in the papers. Um, this uh, oxygen generation system uses electrolysis. The Russian system has been known for failures and fires. Uh, we have a NASA design feature here. We have an empty spot. Um, <laughs> This is for a Sabatier reactor, which will take carbon dioxide and um, convert it to water um, and methane. Uh, it's missing because we've been wanting to fly it for about 40 years. And uh, until the recent cancellation of Constellation, nobody had any time or money to do it. But now we're planning to send it up. There's going to be something stuck in that box. So essentially, this amounts to a full uh, regenerating life support system. That is, it will recycle water. It'll recycle uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen and uh, recycle wastewater and, and uh, purify water that's captured from the humidity. Question? Harry, is it just one of these for um, the whole of the ISS, or one of each? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, this one is quite oversized. It was built uh, when we were contemplating more showers and more things. Uh, they changed the requirements document, but it kept the same hardware. It's cheaper that way. Um, uh, those are space station racks. Uh, they stand about as tall as I am, a little wider. I was I was involved in the uh, checkout, uh, the paperwork checkout of these things before they were shipped to the Cape and launched. They're both launched now. Uh, any other questions on space station? Okay, this is this is it. This is uh, what we have now, and this is what I recommend for the infinite future. Uh, here's the ESM. Uh, I'm going to work with upper and lower bounds on the ESM, both based on the two racks you just saw. Uh, as I mentioned, they recycle water and carbon dioxide. The food can be either hydrated or dehydrated. I come up with a, an upper bound on the ESM uh, using the whole mass of the current racks and using hydrated food. That's about 2,000 kilograms for each crew member uh, to start and another 2,000 uh, for each crew member every year. Uh, and the food cost, it's, uh, it's um, about a kilogram a day. It's, it's, it dominates the mass cost over a long time. Uh, and then if I just assume we can repackage the subsystems and if we go to dehydrated food, the fixed uh, mass is cut in half and the uh, daily mass is cut in the third, about 600 kilograms per day. So these, these are the upper and lower bounds of, of what it would cost to use uh, a space station system, uh, and and the supplies and food dominate the uh, mass cost for the uh, lower bound system. Okay, the other system that has been long considered uh, was developed in Ames, uh, was what we called a cell system, a closed ecological life support system. It's a plant growing system based on hydroponics. Uh, well, plants are good. Plants can take the carbon dioxide we breathe out and the water and and produce oxygen and food which people consume uh, with oxygen and produce carbon dioxide and water and around it goes. This is, this is how the earth works. This is how a closed life support system works. Uh, also, uh, wastewater is transpired directly without chemical change through the leaves of the plants and can be captured. So essentially we can, uh, we can uh, provide life support using uh, uh, a biological system. 
these are uh, chambers at the Kennedy Space Center. We also have them, have had them out at Ames. Uh, here we see lettuce. Here we see wheat. Uh, this, uh, this is a somewhat inefficient system in that it, uh, we have uh, lights, uh, high pressure sodium lights uh, driven from nuclear solar power. Uh, water circulating underneath with uh, uh, chemical nutrients added, a sort of uh, uh, little chemist mix of the, of the trace elements. And this is the uh, equivalent system mass of the biological life support system, both an upper and a lower bound. Uh, a biological life support system providing nearly all the food has an ESM of 20,000 kilograms per crew member. This is uh, like 10 times as much as the uh, uh, physical chemical system, and about 700 kilograms uh, of logistics per year per crew member. And it includes a plant, a growth chamber, and a composter. The composter is needed because half the production of the uh, plant chamber is inedible, and we need to take the compost, burn it, or decompose it with oxygen to create the CO2 for the plants to grow the next batch, so it has to recycle. So. Uh, I worked out uh, some years back an optimum system where we grew only 86% of the calories because it's very difficult to grow fats and oils. Uh, beans and, and uh, uh, such are, are less productive uh, plants, and so the rest was supplied as oil and fat. And these numbers uh, are, are taken from a standard document that has been used to advocate this program for some years, so I felt that they were conservative numbers. Uh, people who see, see look at the numbers have uh, protested at this point, this is usually where I get into other deep trouble, um, that uh, these numbers are, uh, can be improved. Well, maybe not. Uh, a better system, uh, providing only half the food, uh, requires half the fixed mass and about two-thirds of the logistics. And this provides, growing half the food provides the needed oxygen and water recycling for the crew. Well, why is that? Well, you take the crops, you take the edible part, you eat the edible part, you throw away the composted, the, the, the inedible part, you don't bother to compost it, and you take uh, uh, resupplied food, dehydrated food that is also provided, and consume that. So you save a little bit of equipment and can chunk along. So this is, this is probably the uh, most cost-effective way to use biological life support. Okay, and this is the comparison over a period of 800 years. This is the ESM per crew member. Uh, the thin blue line here, this is the ISS lower bound physical chemical system with dehydrated food. It has the lowest ESM out to about 400 years. Uh, that's the ISS system. The ISS upper bound with hydrated food shoots up very rapidly. It has the very, uh, after, after a few decades, it has the highest mass. Now, uh, this dotted red line is the 50% food growing system, and after uh, about 400 years, it has slightly less mass, but it's approximately competitive. Uh, if you grow all the food, it always has higher mass than growing half the food. So um, basically this shows that f for the areas we expect to, the durations we expect to have, using uh, uh, a physical chemical system, such as uh, on the space station, but using it with dehydrated food has the uh, lowest mass. And uh, uh, the purpose of my looking into this was to confirm this. We've always argued that, that uh, bioregenerative life support system will pay out for just a slightly longer mission. Some people said five years, some people said 10 years, some people said, you know, five years if it's a big mission. Well, uh, I was looking for the point where it traded and I find it way beyond anything we're currently planning to do. Okay, so what system do I think we should use? We should use the ISS lower bound life support with dehydrated food. It has the lowest ESM per crew member. But, you know, it's powdered food for 25 generations of people. <laughs> it's not, people say, oh, it's very unattractive. Well, to be fair, using a bioregenerative system growing about half the food and supplying the rest is a reasonable alternative. It doesn't cost that much more. It provides two food sources. If one goes down, you have the other variety in the diet and work for the crew, what are they going to do for 25 generations? Uh, <laughs> full bioregenerator was the expected result for long durations, but once you double the mass for high reliability, add the extra mass for replacing it every 100 years, and using dehydrated food, all this favors using the ISS system. Um, so, um, yes? I have a question. So, uh, 
Would you, how would you reproduce the generations of food? Would you allow them to uh, undergo, uh, like would you be uh, using the seeds that the uh, plants had grown on board or would you carry all your seeds so that you knew the gene stock of everything that you were going to grow for the 25 generations of humans? Uh, good question. I, I didn't mention, um, uh, but you know, essentially a good, a good uh, hydroponic system for growing food in space uses the same kind of crops that you use on Earth, that is lots of wheat. Wheat is a very highly productive uh, crop, can make good use of, of, uh, of uh, intense light, highly intense light. So naturally with wheat, you would have seeds that you could save. Uh, naturally also you'd want to have some seed stock and in case of, of uh, any problems. But you know, wheat is, is uh, uh, essentially the seed is what, is what you eat. So you'd have, you would, uh, as, as always, save some of the seed and resow it. Um, any other questions at this point? Life support system, okay. So here, this is, the, uh, this is where I talk about how big is the spaceship. Well, this is the, this is the mass of the vehicle itself. Well, how do we get the mass of the vehicle? Uh, first of all, we have the mass of the life support system. The ISS lower bound, it's about 2,000 kilograms per crew member. The crew accommodation is equally massive and that totals up to about 4,500. But we have the volume. We add the volume for the, uh, the life support system itself, small, the crew habitat, the crew accommodations, the things that they, the beds and tables and whatever, and then the space for them to live in. And that multiplied by the uh, mass equivalent is another 15,000 uh, kilograms of mass. Uh, the power uh, hit is, a, is about 300 kilograms, and we get a total spacecraft mass of about 20,000 kilograms for each crew member. Uh, we also have a time-varying uh, logistics mass given in, in kilograms per crew member per year, where we have the life support uh, requires uh, some mass flowing in, mostly for food, dehydrated food. Crew accommodations require some supplies. Uh, um, and as I say, this, this is based on uh, detailed analysis of, of planetary missions. I, I used, used uh, established designs there. And we get a certain amount, uh, which, uh, uh, and then we add the volume and, and attribute a certain mass to that volume. And we have a term that increases with time. We have about 1,000 kilograms per crew member per year for uh, uh, logistics. And then I, I plug in the planetary descent vehicle. Now this is, this is the actual mass of the vehicle itself, a, a, a Apollo capsule size mass of about 3,000 kilograms. And then I multiply it by the uh, mass expansion factor due to the fact that we have to decelerate it from the velocity uh, that the interstellar craft is traveling down to, uh, um, down to the uh, rest, uh, rest near the planet. So uh, I uh, note that time is equal to the distance divided by velocity, and I can break it down into d over e divided by v over e. That is, I want to renormalize this equation in terms of normalized distance over exhaust uh, speed and normalized velocity over exhaust speed. I do that for purposes of plugging in the equation for the total mass. This is just the vehicle mass. Well, the equation for the total mass is simply the vehicle mass times e to the v over e. That is, this is the expansion for the uh, propulsion mass. So the total mass is uh, e to the, the exponent uh, of v over e times the total mass expression from the previous uh, page with uh, this d over v uh, inserted for the time factor. And uh, uh, we have a multiplied uh, exponent v over e. It, it appears to the second power. So uh, I plot it out. This is the total mass versus distance and versus velocity. The total mass increases along this axis here up to 3 million uh, kilograms. Uh, the mass is strictly increasing as you increase distance. That is, the further you want to go, uh, the more mass uh, uh, it requires. But if you look at the uh, velocity, there's, there's a slight dip in the velocity. That is, uh, velocities around 1, uh, there's a minimum mass. Um, so you can simply, uh, any 
feasible emissions are anywhere on this, this uh, chart. Uh, if you assume that the distance is 10 light years and assume the exhaust velocity is 5% of the velocity of light, then we have a minimum total mass of uh, 709,000 kilograms per crew member. And that's at the uh, spacecraft velocity is 90% is of the exhaust velocity. That's relatively low. And uh, that result surprised me when I got it. The time, uh, time is out to 222 years. Uh, with, if you think about the economics of the mission, the longer you take, the more life support you're going to need. So that tends, tends to shrink. Uh, uh, that tends to expand mass as, as time gets longer. But in order to make time shorter, you have to uh, apply propellant. Uh, use more propellant. Well, it turns out the exponential effect of propellant is much more important than the linear effect of, of uh, life support mass, so you end up with a relatively uh, low velocity. So that is the, uh, there's the mission right there at uh, relatively slow uh, speeds compared to exhaust velocity. Okay, this is the uh, previous chart redone for the uh, example point, 10 light years 5% uh, exhaust velocity, 5% of the velocity of light. A question? Yeah, I just had a question regarding the, the crew member size in the last one. You sized it per mass per crew member. Yes. Did that take into consideration the fact that you're going to be, populations are going to be increasing and decreasing in cycles as the new families come online and the old families go offline, so to I, speak? I have, con contrary to reasonable expectation, assumed uh, a constant population throughout the duration. That is not, uh, well, that's a definition of a stable society, and certainly living in a tin can for 25 generations would have to be stable. Um, another question? Um, did you make any, um, or is there any mass allotted for anything to generate gravity in the ship as it goes? And if not, are you taking gravity into account at all, landing on a new planet and having lived in weightlessness? I, I, I kind of assumed, I kind of... I kind of didn't bother to enunciate that. It, it goes like this. Uh, gravity is good. You can get gravity by spinning things. It doesn't take a lot to spin things, so I'm, I'm assuming it's spinning. I just assumed that. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, that's going to make the, the engineering easier and the physiology easier, uh, and it doesn't cost much to spin up uh, whatever it is. So it'd be a, it, the, the, the spacecraft would have a, a spherical construction. I could have gotten some cute art, I guess, doing that, but I just, I just assumed that. Yes, sir. Um, in your mission plan, how, um, in your mission plan um, how many years of food uh, per crew member are you uh, allocating for when they first descend? Because it will take them a while to ramp up native food production on their colony. Uh, the answer is zero, and the further, <laughs> the further answer is on my last chart. Um, <laughs> That is, I'm presuming that there will be, they'll, I, I'm presuming there'll be turkeys waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jill, for mentioning that. You know, even when North America was colonized by Europeans, these colonies had to, when North America was being uh, colonized by Europeans, I mean, this is, that's you know, a very similar ecosystem, but there was enough that, differences that's not the way, in North America. That's not, that's not what my Indian blood told me. Okay, there, <laughs> there were turkeys here, actually. That's where they came from. No, come on. Come on. It's, uh, in fact, in fact a, an awful lot of the colonial era, that is the uh, Spanish uh, ex explorers, whatever, they, they, they put goats and sheep and various things on different islands. You know, that's how... Uh, the original Robinson Crusoe survived on uh, Selkirk. And uh, I'm presuming some, some uh, pre-development of the target planet, which I'll get to, okay? So I, ha I have a better answer than I'm giving you now because I, I put it on my last chart. I just thought of it yesterday, but I thought of it. Okay, so here we are, 10 light years away, uh, good exhaust velocity, maybe a little too optimistic, only 222 years. How does it all crank down? Well, we still have the same fixed mass uh, uh, oh, for the spacecraft, uh, uh, but we bring in, uh, we can now figure out uh, how much logistics mass we're going to need, how much food we're going to need for the 222 years, and that turns out to be vastly larger than the spacecraft uh, mass itself. That is, it's, uh, uh, 
nearly 300,000 kilograms per uh, crew member. And that's for the logistics mass, and that includes the volume being factored in. Uh, then uh, the spacecraft uh, descent vehicle has to be its, its original 3,000 uh, kilograms plus uh, more than 4,000 kilograms more for uh, the propellant. And uh, this gives you the, uh, the total mass of the spacecraft that's rolling out. Now, at, these low, at this low ratio of, of exhaust speed to final velocity, uh, we still more than double the, the total mass. So how does it all work out? The life support logistics is a big factor. It's 20% of all the mass. Uh, the crew accommodations, a big hunk. Uh, the logistics, rather. The crew accommodations, logistics, the, the towels and whatever. Uh, the junk, there's tons of junk. Uh, that's 9%. The storage space for it is another 8%. So in total, you should really figure the logistics at 15%. So, a co um, but that includes the uh, uh, food as well as the accommodations. Uh, the spacecraft itself is only 3%. The planetary descent vehicle, 1%. I've, I made it too small. We can afford something bigger than the, an Apollo descent, I think. Maybe we can put in a little food, a few turkeys, uh, a little, uh, a few tools. You know, they won't have to use rocks and sticks. But nonetheless, propulsion is uh, 59%. So life support, uh, basically, uh, I just have like five conclusion slides, uh, um, which I will take questions on. Uh, OK. I conclude physical and chemical life support with dehydrated food requires less mass than growing food using current technology. Uh, it turns out, I wondered why this was, so I worked out the numbers. If you, if you reduce the nuclear energy uh, and compare it to the food calories, you take a million times more energy at the nuclear end than you get out in the food end. So that's a, you know, if you just take the food, you're, 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 you're bypassing a million to one uh, inefficiency. Well, on the other hand, growing food has a great potential for mass reduction. Anything that's a million to one inefficient could be improved. Um, and dehydrated food is not going to get any smaller. Okay. Uh, a half food growing, half dehydrated food system is attractive. It has fresh food, useful work. Uh, whenever I present my uh, slides that are negative on bioregenerative life support, everybody says, oh, but we can do better, we can do better. We can do 50% better. Well, in that case, it would make it, make it uh, competitive, okay? It should, be, it should be better than competitive. I argue here that food growing efforts for space must find significant mass reductions and major increases in efficiency, perhaps using unrelated basic research. We've spent decades, I have grown wheat myself in a chamber, and tens of millions of dollars around the world, including flight experiments, on this uh, not so promising technology. This is usually where I get lynched and I can't go any further. But in fact, in fact, uh, uh, work right now, for instance, in artificial photosynthesis producing uh, fuels, uh, fuel from, from light does have the promise of, of uh, bypassing some of this uh, and, and being, being some new basic research that could change the, uh, the whole equation. Uh, life support doesn't cost much for brief missions. It dominates uh, long missions and the logistics mass becomes a major cost for things like 10-year space station, 10-year moon base, or, be, or more than that. Uh, uh, physical and chemical life support with dehydrated food is the least expensive uh, for anything we're thinking about now. We're thinking about a flexible path, maybe going to Mars, and whatever, even far beyond that, outer solar system. Uh, it's, it's, uh, bioregenerative does not beat it. Uh, so we need to do our research now on uh, high reliability systems and improving dehydrated food. And if we do any research in growing uh, food in space, it should focus on breakthroughs. Okay, that, that concludes what I have on life support. Now I'm gonna, and then my next charts are on the mission. Um, I was just wondering, a la the movie 2001, you see we've got the time ready to do this. We will know how to hibernate people at maybe you know one percent normal metabolism or something. I'll, and I'll, that's I'll certainly a big be hibernating factor. by the time we know how to do this. Um, it, I, I restricted my my work to things that were possible with current physics and current technology. If uh, there there are plenty of, I would say undoubtedly there will be breakthroughs that make this more possible than it is now. But I didn't include any unknown breakthroughs, Jill, or. Yeah, I'm, I'm missing some mass here, Harry. With your growing food, you say you eat only half of it, throw half of it away. 
as I recall. That's, that's with the uh, growing half the food and supplying half the food system. That's yeah, but you lower. only eat half of it. You actually don't bother to compost and reuse half of it. You said you throw, you throw it away. You throw away the inedible biomass. Where do you throw it? Out the door. Therefore, your spacecraft gets lighter as you go on and your velocity increases. No, because the, the initial impulse was, was done all at the beginning. Okay. Your, your trash is going along with you at the same time, which is, is why you don't bother to throw it out. Uh, that gentleman with the red shirt. So to go back to the hibernation question, uh, even though hibernation of adults is probably beyond our reach uh, with current technology and it's not clear whether it will ever be possible even, um, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, hibernation of uh, embryos uh, is uh, pretty much either you know, is already almost possible or, or will be possible. Right. Yeah. That's, um, I agree that there are many things, well, you know, Brave New World used, used uh, artificial embryos. Uh, many, many ideas, there are many interesting social and reproductive ideas that I don't get into that could solve some of the problems uh, of, of genetics and, and, and social behavior, but I don't get into that. Uh, I'm not going to even have that in a further chart. Let me, let me do my last couple. Uh, okay, oh, this, yeah, this is it. Uh, first of all, an interstellar mission will be a big deal. Vast distance, long duration, astronomical cost, not in the current budget. Um, the key design trade is higher uh, launch mass and higher cost for increased probability of success. If you have more mass, you have more crew, you have higher reliability, you can go faster. But the lowest mass is achieved with a small crew at slow speeds. Uh, increasing the travel speeds requires exponentially more mass, uh, but the mass for high reliability life support increases only slowly. So we're going to have to take the time in order to do the mission. The example uh, minimum mission mass was uh, 709,000 kilograms per crew member, including everything the, uh, for the 222 years. Uh, a crew of 30 would then qu require 21 million kilograms, which is 870 launches of the shuttle. And the shuttle is a big launch vehicle. Okay, so that's a lot. Uh, the typical cost quoted is 25 kilograms, uh, 25 thousand dollars per kilogram. This is based on taking the shuttle uh, budget for a year, three or four billion dollars, and uh, dividing it by the, uh, the capacity of the four or six uh, shuttles that we might launch on that budget. So it's twenty-five thousand uh, dollars per kilogram. So this means that it's five hundred thirty billion dollars just to launch this uh, twenty-one million kilograms. Uh, that's a nice big number. Uh, <laughs> Apollo cost about 135 current uh, billion dollars current money, so it's like four times bigger than Apollo. On the other hand, Apollo was, all, was about 15% of one year's uh, GDP in the late 60s. That is, it ran about 4 or 5% of the federal budget over several years, and uh, uh, the federal budget was a third or so, 40% of the GDP. So. That's 50, it was, Apollo cost us 15% of, of GDP for one year. 15% of GDP now, which is uh, 14 trillion, is 2 trillion. So, with this 2 trillion, if NASA got the same amount of money, we could do four of these. Uh, not, not very likely. Uh, but I also saw the, the cost of the Iraq war yesterday. And uh, whether you like it or not, it costs more than that. It costs 700 billion. So 15% uh, of GS GDP will give you four interstellar missions or three Iraq wars. Um, it's, a, it's a social choice. Okay, um, an interstellar mission now is technically possible, but it's socially impractical. That is, it's not on the horizon, it can't be done, it's not, it doesn't have a uh, quick payoff, it's not within one congressional cycle. Um, so, but it will be much easier later with continued technical progress and economic growth and with improved space capabilities and lower launch cost. The launch cost, everybody says, oh, we have to get the launch cost down. Well, shuttle is expensive. Shuttle is tricky. Shuttle requires people. Um, but I haven't seen any quotes. I mean, like the re reusables are, are still most of that uh, price. Any questions at this point? Sir. 
Harry, uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a layman. I have two questions. Life support. Yes. Uh, I assume today we are not able to examine the atmosphere of a planet in the Alpha Centauri system, so we don't know whether there's True. breathable air anywhere. Is that right? That's right. So th does that not mean we would have to transport down uh, all of our life support equipment, blah, 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 answer in this on the, descent Answer vehicle. on the next and last chart. And, then, the and the other question is, uh, is uh, can't this huge uh, ship be assembled in space like the International oh, Space yeah. Station was, rather than launched from Earth? Was that your assumption? Uh, it will... Uh, it turns out that it was originally thought that a uh, space station could be assembled in space, but it turned out to be impossible. Uh, it's, it's, it's taken up in big, big large modules in the, in the uh, uh, shuttle. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Do you know um, offhand how much the mass per crew member of like a shuttle launch is? So, you know, assuming it was just the purpose to put people up there. Well, I th the shuttle can take eight folks and... Uh, it's bigger than the Apollo capsule. I don't know what it is. Don't know what it is. Uh, sir. So in the 60s, uh, Freeman Dyson did a relatively similar examination of interstellar travel. He didn't focus he, on life support. He did the, the Orion project, yeah. Yeah, but he also did a short paper where he actually looked at the cost of traveling to other stellar systems. Uh -huh. And in that, he was using relatively low technology, but the, the number I remember out of that I was struck by was in his calculation at, the, at the, that growth of gross national product, it would take two to 300 years before we could actually afford to do that kind of mission. Your number is much more optimistic. Yeah, that's right. Do you understand that distinction? Oh, I, I understand the distinction. I understand the motivation. I was there. Okay, here's how it works. Uh, in those days, I worked on the SETI project. In those days, we had a vision that we would communicate with extraterrestrials and they would be benevolent, they would be helpful, they would supply us uh, ways to avoid nuclear war and cure cancer and live happily. And you know, they would never bother us because interstellar travel was impossible. So people like Barney Oliver and Sebastian von Horner and others wrote uh, papers with reasonable assumptions. Okay, well, do we, do we need to go to a nearby star, but of course we have to do it within a lifetime. We have to do it in a fairly plush manner in a fairly large group. They soon found that, that it took many uh, decades of GNP to do the mission, and so it was impossible. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. I'm looking at it another way. Um, the, the, SETI, the SETI universe is a universe filled with planets that are communicating. Um, that's not the universe the SETI search has, has found, okay? Uh, that is, uh, we haven't, we haven't uh, since Fra Frank Drake's first search, we have not, uh, you know, we haven't found people instantly. In fact, uh, I remember vividly the day uh, in 1966 when the Joe at the next desk turned to me and said, we found them. I said, we found what? The ETs, the ET signal has come. Well, it was the pulsars and it was a rumor <coughs> that search, you know. Uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, you can, a lot depends on the assumptions that you make here, and uh, I think my assumptions are reasonable. But, you know, it's a very minimal mission. You know, we're dropping, we're parachuting people in with, uh, with uh, you know, minimal, it's a minimal mission. It's no return, you know. That's another assumption you can make. Jill. Um, so you're going to do a long, slow mission, right? Yes. But you put these folks in a time capsule. Their technology is unchanging over centuries even though the, the communication speed is less than 10 years. Yes. And so the information could travel to them that would allow them to take advantage of advanced technologies. Yes. And as you said, what the heck are they going to be doing for 25 generations? Why aren't they reinventing their life support system with greater efficiencies and that's, that sort of that's thing? That's a good idea. I have, okay, let's, time for my last chart. Um, as I was thinking about, I was thinking about this uh, talk, which I had given before in a, in a more life support oriented uh, uh, forum. Um, what am I assuming? What happens before and what happens after the interstellar mission? Well, before the interstellar colonizing mission, number one, suitable planets have to be observed. Uh, Bill Baruch, he took 30 years to get his Kepler project uh, funded. And uh, we, should, we should be able to find you know, where 
in the cosmos, some, some where in the galaxy, where nearby are some suitable planets. Next step, robot exploration, just as we do in the solar system. It can be much smaller, much faster uh, than, than the interstellar ship with people, and then we can select where we want to go. It's, um, uh, obviously, the robot probes can do, do sensors uh, and uh, mapping and, and send back information. Next, we could send forward to this planet, again, in a smaller, faster uh, probe, uh, d microbes that can do terraforming. We can do engineered plants and animals. Now, I'm presuming we will find an oxygen atmosphere or be able to create an oxygen atmosphere. And so we could create an Eden that waits for the colonists. This simply means that uh, any people that land there would have a, a good chance of surviving. Of course, that would be a primitive uh, survival. Uh, go ahead. So after the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis on Earth, it took at least 300 million years to get 1% of oxygen in the atmosphere. I think that to say that you could terraform on a scale of, you know, hundreds of human lifetimes is that's, unlikely that's a good point. if you did not have an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Well, Reasonable oxygen's only been on Earth for about 300, the last 300 million years. Okay. That's, that's a good point, but don't forget two things were happening. One is oxygen was building up, but the other is uh, microbes were evolving to produce it. You know, no? You think all the, ox all the microbes existed from, from day one? That, that, uh, yeah? Sorry. Okay. Um, if we don't find something with an oxygen atmosphere, then obviously uh, we have a uh, much longer, possibly impossible terraforming project. That was your point, right? Okay. But... What if we succeed? What happens afterwards? If successful, ultimately we could produce another Earth. Uh, as Jill just pointed out, we would be maintaining radio communication throughout the voyage and after the landing. Uh, that would be relatively easy to do, and we could do technology transfer. After a while, after the uh, population buildup, we'd be increasing the scale of the interconnected human domain. It seems true that uh, the larger society is, the larger group of people that are uh, interconnected and part of the same economy and the same science and the same technology. The more specialization there is, the more advancements there are, and this increasing this could uh, ultimately boost the scale of progress. Uh, we'd all also gain space for alternate social and ecological experiments and reduce human vulnerability to ecological or astronomical disasters. We don't have to worry about the uh, one asteroid; we need at least two. Uh, this will be a thousand-year project. Uh, what would make it happen? How, it's certainly not in today's budget, what kind of society, what kind of government, what kind of world would do such a thing? Well, I don't know. Anything that, uh, if I have no more questions, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Question here. Um, does the mass that you've budgeted for the actual spacecraft take into consideration shielding from expected radiation in space and expected small or even microscopic impacts to the ship? No, but the spacecraft itself is so small that, that you, could, you could easily include some of that, you know? Okay. Who have a nice, who, okay, you again. <laughs> Could you um, uh, go over again how you determine the optimal cruising speed, uh, which is, you know, equivalently the time to travel to, to a star to try to optimize cost? And, and, and how does the cost of the mission depend on the distance to the star? Uh, that was in that last uh, little uh, thingy I showed you. Uh, right here. Essentially... The longer the distance, the higher the mass, and if you, if you plot this equation out, you can see that there's a minimum at a certain uh, uh, velocity that's approximately equal to the exhaust velocity. So yeah, the further, it co the more it costs, the longer it takes, and uh, uh, the more uh, force we have pushing, uh, the less it would cost. Uh, this is, D is in this equation, bingy right there. Uh, in other words, uh, what happens is, um, I would say yes, given other factors being fixed. You. 
Were you generating power with an RTG or with a reactor? Uh, reactor, SP100 thingy or whatever. Just say, combine my co question about hibernation with uh, Jill Tarter's comment about radio or TV communication is one of the things that could be communicated during the centuries of the voyage is how to hibernate people. <laughs> and now it would take an act of faith to set off assuming you would learn how to hibernate yeah. en route, but you know, right. uh, some you people might have that faith. There are lots of things that go over the radio <laughs> and lots of things that don't. You know, uh, information travels, information is cheap, information, but you know, hardware or chemicals or drugs or apparatus would have to be developed and might be difficult. Uh. Uh, a comment, which is to say, your star, your multi-generation starship, uh, you're essentially launching an island into space. Okay. Uh, and observing your stricture on reproductive technology on islands, there are certain evil, uh, evolutionary trends you see. Species get bigger or smaller. Uh, right. They also get tamer. And I'm contemplating the possibility that we could arrive on our new planet, our new Eden, um, with a tame, guileless, innocent, naive, friendly uh, attitude that might not do us much good. That's very interesting. Well, definitely uh, attitude depends a lot on the social environment, and this will be a very protected environment. Also, but I don't want to get into uh, genetics, and, and, but there are, there are ways to prevent genetic drift. And uh, there have been science fiction uh, stories that argue that perhaps uh, Little people would be the best people on such a such an expedition. Uh, it's all, you know, somewhat socially incorrect to talk about all this. You. So I'll just come back on terraforming now. I've not got a mouthful of cookies, which is that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my bad. It's the the basic metabolism that uh, the the organelles that are in vascular plants now are the basically the same organelles which evolved two and a half or three billion years ago, and if you want to get oxygen in the atmosphere at 20 percent, it's not just creating that number of moles of oxygen, you've got to fight the planetary geochemistry. And that's why it took, you know, 300 million years before you'd even get up to 1 percent oxygen, and then another, you know, 2 billion years before you could get up to above 10 percent oxygen. You've got a lot of math to fight, you know. The geology of the planet is going to weigh, you know, 10 to the 21 kilograms, so saying you could geoengineer an oxygen-rich atmosphere on a human time scale, if it does not exist already, is simply unfeasible. I agree. I agreed the first time. Uh, Howard, we, should, <laughs> we should point out that it won't take long for us to, def to, to, to be looking in, into planetary, exoplanetary atmospheres and detecting it right. ozone very easily. And, Inferring the presence of it'll, oxygen, it'll yeah. definitely be. We could pick our worlds pretty well. It'll be definitely, it'll be definitely hard to d detect uh, atmospheres remotely. But I'm envisioning probes being sent and, and locally examining. Uh, but yes. your dehydrated food is supposed to last the entire trip. You're packing all of it to begin with. Yes. Well, we're finding out that in the space food that we're packaging for the uh, space shuttle and for the space station. Within three months, you're already losing nutrient value up to about 30 percent. Not mineral value, but the, the vitamins and the stuff that's organic that you need to live. Uh, do, you have, do you have a reference where I can uh, find that oh, written? Oh, gee. Not at the moment. I was reading I, something in the Ames uh, uh, newsletter, I think it was. Well, whenever I do this, uh, I run into trouble both from the uh, uh, plant people and the food people. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have plenty of cans on my shelf that are older than three months. Well, it won't kill you. It just won't be in, nutritionally rich enough for you to survive. It, well, uh, You can for 18 months, but that's what the shelf life is. Well, I'm thinking, you know, well, yes, well, we have some time to, to work on it. Uh, they're, they're probably, don't forget, we have the access to deep space, uh, cold and vacuum. We can... Uh, we can uh, it's the organics that are done. Well, what's, what's causing the loss of nutrients in that water? That happens even if you freeze it. Try one more question, and then we'll uh, allow you to approach the speaker. Up. <laughs> no, no, not that. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, not contemplating uh, or discussing reproductive technologies, 
It's the same thing as contemplating Catholicism without sin. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to make any NASA statements on uh, what might be good ideas. So, uh, Harry, we'd like to present you with a uh, small memento of your talk today here. Okay. And, uh, okay. If you'll okay. uh, thank me and uh, uh, <laughs> join me in thanking Harry for his great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for the pleasure.